Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I've said to a couple of you, this is very daunting, um, mainly because of the calibre of great speakers. So, uh, as mentioned, my name's Corinne Prosk, and um, I've been at NAB now for 11 years. And I'm just going to share a little bit of a story of, of why I've stayed there and how you change and can use large corporates and, from, and change from within. Now, it all kind of starts with, with a bulldozer. And um, I was 14 and really desperately wanting to go to an anti-logging uh, protest when my father said to me, is it really worth kind of strapping yourself to a tree or, you know, you're going to save one at a time? Or what about actually learning to drive the bulldozer? Because then you can work out where it will go. So taking his wisdom, I've continued and started to drive the bulldozer. And the bulldozer through corporates does allow you to work out where you go next and which tree decides to be moved. So today I really want to inspire you to think differently about the power of corporations and what can actually be done and how they interact with our you know, social and societal expectations. Also, I'd like you to share this story because I think it's about sharing the good stories and I think it was, it was some of the discussion yesterday around peace. We often look at the negative, what about the positives? And, and start to uh, inspire others. So, um, NAB, 20,000 employees within Australia, 800 branches, 4 million customers, and probably everyone in this room who's Australian, your superannuation. So, large organisation. Uh, the assets are, are all money, so it's not bricks and mortar like mining where you, you, know, you have a 30-year plan, you kind of shift the money around. So basically when I joined, we've taken the organisation on a long journey around microfinance and how to help those Australians who get locked out of the financial system to start joining in. Since then, we've written 100,000 loans and we've spent $115 million in loan capital. This is just the beginning. That is 2% of the demand, and I'm out there to, to make a difference to as many as we can to get that, that statistic up. So what we'll cover today is really what is microfinance, a couple of tips on how do you survive a large corporate, and a bit of the story of what we've been able to do. So the first so the first thing is microfinance. It's really key to start looking for solutions in places you don't expect. A developing world solution in a developed economy. The program we run is one of the largest in the developed uh, economy space, but it really came from a concept of an economist, Muhammad Yunus, who, who will be in Australia later on this year, who really looked at economic empowerment and not just from the financial sense, but what it actually does to your self-esteem and how, you know, like all of us, we like to choose the kind of life that we want to live. That same story, which occurred over 30 years ago, uh, then took place in, in Collingwood in Melbourne through a community agency called Good Shepherd Youth and Family Service. Um, we've partnered with Good Shepherd and I have to really thank them for their honesty and patience to, to put up with <laughs> the crap that a corporate does sometimes dish out. And, and through them, we learnt about the power of small loans. The vast majority of our portfolio is actually for personal lending, not business lending, which is where it differs from a lot of the developing world uh, economy. Um, the other piece that is quite similar is it's a vast majority of women who are borrowers. But what we're finding is that, that that's actually not where the need lies and we're actually looking at male-focused products at present. To give you a flavour, I'll give you Mary's story. So Mary grew up as a child from um, two uh, migrant parents and at the age of eight her father got critically ill and, and passed away from cancer. That left Mary and her mum to kind of fend for themselves and, um, and Mary's mum couldn't work because, because she was looking after her daughter and then the fridge broke down and for six months Mary had to 
Mary and her mother had to deal with an esky and, um, and, and, she, and really, you know, was struggling from a day-to-day -day perspective. That's an expensive way to live. I hear the esky story way too often. Mary's mother, by chance, came across Good Shepherd and, um, and heard about this thing called a no interest loan and uh, was able to secure a loan, which exactly has that, no interest, none of these kind of uh, weird 24 months interest free type products and bought a brand new fridge. Um, that provided her with the ability to, to purchase in bulk but she also had the ability to choose the type of fridge she wanted and that empowerment of going in and buying something new uh, was also as important as the ability to store the food. I hear Mary's story every, every day. Um, I hear it about fridges, I hear it about washing machines, about cars, about beds, um, you know. A lot of people don't leave domestic violence because they can't take the furniture. Um, you know, we hear lots of really interesting stories. So, with that kind of in mind, we start to explore what does something like a no interest loan mean to an organisation whose core business is lending. So, we started to look at um, keeping an open mind and then kind of exploring what, what do you do? So the idea was there's got to be this synergy. We're really good at lending money. Okay, we like to attach an interest and that was quite an interesting discussion with management around no interest. Um, but what was more of interest to them was that these loans are paid back and the default rate's less than 3%. So the people that we won't necessarily back actually pay it all back. And that was a real mind shift because we all come to the table with our preconceived ideas as to what people deserve and can afford. So there's 3 million Australians or you know, nearly the equivalent of Adelaide who sit on the fringes of our financial system. And for me that's just not good enough. Uh, that means they have difficulty accessing basic bank accounts, credit or insurance. Credit is by far the hardest one to address and, and you know from a bank's perspective you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you provide too much we then have uh, problems as we've seen in the US. If you don't provide enough you're sending them to loan sharks and cash converters and, and other kind of fringe lenders. So but there was such a synergy there with, with the loan piece that I thought okay this is where you get into the bulldozer and you start to change the direction. So one of the senior managers uh, said to us after he heard a story like Mary's, let's just write a check. And uh, at that point I was like, no, let's redesign the system. I had no idea that was going to be that ambitious. But instead of driving the bulldozer through the bran branch, we started with a small program called a, and it's a small loan program called a step up loan. It's for $3,000, it's mainly cars and car repairs. And, and step up, I had a 10, 10 year birthday uh, last month. And we, we started to build these loans. Now, we had this great product, it was cheap, it met all of the needs, and no one was buying it. And what we realised was that, that this consumer group doesn't, didn't trust us, didn't trust our community partners was so used to being ripped off that a good offering just was actually too hard. So we, we struggled and um, finally got an, we issued our first loan. It was actually a casual staff member from Good Shepherd, which was kind of a bit of a letdown because, you know, we were here trying to save the world. I'd signed the bank up for this program and I couldn't get anyone through the doors. So it, it took me six months to write 15 of these loans. By this stage I'd done the economics, it was costing me over 50000 to run a $3,000 loan to write each one. I was like, you know, I was thinking of that tipping point, you know, that was that really hard period of, oh no. And, um, but we persisted and we got to year one and we'd had 50 loans. Then we started to run these competitions of when are we going to hit 100 and so forth. Each little chunk we actually celebrated as a win. 
um, and we'd show, share it out, take it to senior management, take it to, to the collections team, take it to the guys who issue credit cards, show them where our program worked better than some of the mainstream pieces. Took it to legal and said, can I put credit and safe together as words? We got there. It's a safe, affordable loan. Um, so, you know, we just kind of were aware and just kept pushing the boundaries and, and gently kind of achieving the next step and looking at what came after that. Since then, we were, we've been able to secure 130 million in capital. Um, we've issued those loans, we've won awards. We've gone into small business loans. We're also looking at social finance. Um, we've gone into a match savings program. Uh, and, and most importantly, we provide the capital for the no interest loan scheme that, that changed Mary's life. And then kind of we hit a plateau again, you know, it gets tough, NAB's going, we really like this stuff, but there's no more money. So I scratched my head and I thought, oh, we still haven't actually hit the target we need to get to. So I um, thought, okay, where do I get money from? And then we had the GFC hit us and it was probably, it was one of those fortuitous things for us. Suddenly everyone wanted to know about what happened to the financial needs of poor people. And um, so with Good Shepherd, we went to, to the federal government and we said, we've got this great thing. We just need money to be able to expand it across our communities. We now, we initially secured 18 and a half million, which has allowed us to take, roll it out to 600 uh, locations within our communities and to deliver, be delivered by uh, not-for-profits. I think there's about 300 that are involved. We've actually started to create a workforce of, of, of microfinance loan workers. Um, and it's just been amazing. And each year now we're writing 25,000 loans. The partnership with government has been also quite um, unusual in that they'd never backed a corporate, let alone a banking product. Um, but they could see what was being achieved. And we've had some people go from the, the no interest loan to then the step up loan to then opening up their businesses. And just being able to see people kind of move and, and develop the, the self-esteem and um, such that they, they feel that they're empowered to, to manage their money better. So <clears throat> I think what, what's been essential in that journey is a, you've got to share the passion, and I ask our senior management, and I take different teams every month, to walk down Smith Street in Collingwood, to have a look at what it feels like to be locked out, to hear Mary's story, to, to see what we're doing, what works, where, where it doesn't work. I've had the C CEOs do that, everyone gets put through it. Personal loans team and the credit cards were really confronted. Um, but it also makes them rethink about well, what kind of business do they want to be running. If you think about the power of organisations, you know, Walmart is the 25th largest economy in the world and Yahoo has a bigger economy than Mongolia. So what kind of power can we do if we start to align those um, social objectives? Anyway, Mary, Mary grew up and um, and Mary now works in my team, and that is her um, name, and she runs the Step Up Loans program. And for me, that is the best of the stories because Mary now designs the solutions that her mother needed. And it's people like that, like her, uh, and, and throughout the team, I've got a team of 10 who work on these things. We are using the skills to be able to re-engineer the infrastructure that is used for profit making to also look at social outcomes. And it doesn't necessarily have to lose money. And as I mentioned to someone earlier, I'm not a real believer of philanthropy because we actually need this stuff to self-fund itself so that we can get the scale. And to get to those three million, we need to have ongoing income streams so that we can meet all of those needs, not just those who just be who are lucky enough to hear us. So what do I want you to do? I want you to listen to this story and share it with others and to tell them about Mary's story and to look at what 
organisations try to do from within and, and to sometimes, you know, let, let the good stories come forward because our key challenge in the growth and what is possible is the fact that no one wants to listen. And I find that personally the biggest tragedy because there is so much resource, so much skill. And when you give people a good idea, the, I can't you know, stop the volunteers from lining up, the people trying to get into our department, um, because th there's suddenly opportunity and hope. Anyway, that's kind of where we've got to. Mary's also helping me um, work through our next kind of ambitious goal. And sometimes you just gotta be ambitious and put it out there. And that's, we're calling it Mission One Million. And by 2018, we want to have reached one million people. And, and for me, that's one million loans out there, but it's also probably three million families that get touched. And we know that children learn their financial behaviours in the first 10 years of their life. And managing your money is about your emotional relationship to it. It's not necessarily about the specific arithmetic. So if we're able to start changing the values around money for a whole generation, that's what's worth living for. So thank you. And, and I really want to thank Mary for being my biggest inspiration. <laughs>